Hello folks and welcome to our game with myself Shane Stapleton as always joined by Michael Verney who's over at Cheltenham at the moment. Any winners? Uh, doing okay, doing okay. Um, it's kind of the Willie Mullins show over here this week. He reached 100 Cheltenham Festival winners yesterday which is just to- totally unheard of. It's like... We like John Kiley winning 15 All Irelands with Limerick, which which may which may happen, but um, just to- totally unheard of. Like, I think it took him 20 years to get to 10, and in the 17 years since, he's accumulated 90 Cheltenham Festival winners. It's just like the perfect star and the perfect team, the perfect buyers, the perfect jockeys. It's like the whole thing is couldn't be running any better, as Ruby Walsh said yesterday. He's the CEO, his wife is the CFO, and his son Patrick is the managing director. It's just this business that just seems to run seamlessly. I'm sure it doesn't run seamlessly, but uh, he's uh, yeah, he's totally rewritten all the rules on you know what it takes to be a top trainer. It's, it's amazing, really. And the people, some people would say it is like Dublin winning. If Dublin were winning ten or twelve in a row, it does get. It can grow tiresome if the same face they're winning the whole time, but you have to kind of laud the brilliance of it as well, and it, it's 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 amazing, really. Do you ever see any boxing matches over there? Because um, I I saw a video flying around of lads poking heads off each other wearing their suits, and the girls are they're all done up as well, and it's just mental looking. Considering you know this is supposed to be a thing where you put your best foot forward, wear your Sunday best. Yeah, some people put their worst <laughs> worst foot forward. I would say I I don't I've never seen any of that because. I suppose we're kind of sheltered from it a bit. If you're in the middle of the, the Guinness tent or you're down somewhere like that, you you might see it. But no, I'm generally not uh, generally not seeing any of that. I don't know if you saw the, the videos going around of the cars getting stuck in the car park, though. Yeah, like, literally, like you, you can barely you can only see half of the wheels on, on some of the cars. Like I don't know whether they they pitched up and slept in the cars for the night or what they did, but uh, it was a bit of a disaster. Crowds are well down as well. It was only about forty six thousand here yesterday. Right. That's two. That's two thirds full. Uh, tickets costing too much. Um, services within the race course costing too much. The racing quality diluted somewhat, maybe because Willie Mullins is so strong and he's scaring away a lot of other people, I'd say, as well. Um, you know the way you can you can't take it for granted that people are gonna show up to something. You have to keep you have to keep it fresh for them, you have to keep um you know, the service costs have to be competitive. The, the ticket costs have to be competitive as well, or people will eventually stop, maybe stop showing up. That's why, you know, I'd worry about the GA sometimes as regards even all Ireland final ticket prices. They, they just think they will always sell. But if you've seen in recent years, like hurling final tickets are quite plentiful the morning of a final, or even mm, the yeah. day coming up to it, things don't sell out. You can't just put an extra 10 euro, 20 euro on top of tickets and expect people to keep coming and coming and coming, especially, um, how you know? I don't know, but I don't know what what you think. But Jesus, at home, it just seems like everything costs miles more than it did before, and it seems to be a hell of a lot less money flying around as well. But you can't take for granted that people are just going to show up, and I do, they'll have to learn that lesson over here. And the GA need to kind of tread carefully in that regard too. Just because people have always done it, you can't expect them to keep doing it unless you like. You pay a hundred euro for an All Ireland ticket. Do you get any more than you did twenty years ago when you paid probably you know? half the price and i know inflation goes up and stuff like that but you don't at least throw in your match program with it throw in something you know something with it you know i just think um i think we're treading a kind of a thin line even you know regards big games like that you can't just always expect people to show up and keep charging them more and more and more what's the most outrageously priced thing you've seen over there is it like a hot dog like a pint you know what are we looking at here yeah i don't i don't see that kind of thing as much but i know like that pints are like like say eight or nine pounds for a pint, even a ticket for a Cheltenham club enclosure is like a hundred and thirty pounds for a day. I know that. Um, I know that. Um, Cyril Crow, Marie Crow, the reporter, uh, her brother was um bringing over the kids in that, and it was a hundred and thirty for him, hundred and thirty for his wife, and then like I think half price for five and six year olds to get in. So you're looking at like oh, 450 quid or so to get four people into. Cheltenham, which is just bonkers, really. Like it's abs- that's absolute banana stuff. Like, yeah, it sure is. Um, look, we've a lot to cover on the show today. There's a full round of National League hurling and National League football. We're going to have Keen Johnson on a little bit later, talking about a few things related to football. We're going to jump straight into our second power rankings of the year. 
And you can see there on the bottom left of that image that the the list we had before the league started with Limerick at one, Clare at two, Kilkenny three, fourth and fifth were Galway and Tipperary, you had, uh, Cork, Watford, Dublin, and then nine, ten, and eleven were Wexford, Antrim, Carlow. So we're basically going with the teams that are going to be operating at Liam McCarthy Cup. This year, there's other teams who would obviously say, well, we're as good as the teams towards the latter end of that table. And that's absolutely true. But just to keep the list a little bit simple, we're going Liam McCarthy only. Do you see any obvious change on this list? Um, you, you did mention there that the certain counties may be excluded because they're not Liam McCarthy. But you definitely would think you definitely have Westmead towards that tail end after beating Antrim, wouldn't you? And you'd probably have... Awfully in around the mix, maybe as well. Take the Cork roll result out. You probably have them around the mix down the bottom as well. As regards other counties that have made strides, uh, Wexford would definitely come up a couple of spots. They're still unbeaten this year. They've uh, you know beat Waterford. They've drawn with a, a couple of other big hitters as well. Drew with, Drew with Clare. Like they're not just bringing you know solid form against other Leinster counties to the table. They're bringing good form against Munster counties to the table as well. A draw with Clare, who are obviously we have at number two and a defeat of Waterford who were two places ahead of him on the previous table. So definitely Wexford would definitely deserve to come up a couple of spots anyway. Yeah. I think Clare deserve to stay in number two. I mean, goes without saying that Limerick will be at number one, like Clare have three wins and a draw from what we've seen so far. And this is without Tony Kelly. I'm not sure when Ryan Taylor is going to be back. You'd hope to, in not too long. Shane O'Donnell hasn't played just yet. They've broadened out their panel. There's a couple of good lads lean in the backs. He looks like a good lad Rin around midfield. Like they've developed their panel a little bit more. So there's no reason to not have them at number two, I'm sure you'll agree. Yeah, no, and this has been probably Clare's best league campaign, I would say, since Brian Lowen's first year, when they got to that league final that was played as um that was played as a Munster quarter final during mm. COVID. Like they've been very, very solid, as you say, with a hell of a lot of new faces in there. That's kind of that's really promising now, you'd have to say. And when they're in this position. They don't have any silverware yet. Uh, we kind of maybe said, you know, maybe a league title is not what Brian Lone is looking for. But now that they have themselves in this position, um, I don't see why they'd really be holding back too much at this stage. They've got themselves in a really, really good position. You're two wins away from having silverware on the table with a lot of new faces. And I think whatever about 2024, I think that would have a fairly positive spin-off for those young fellas that are going to be there probably for the goods of the next decade. So now that they have themselves in the position and it might be in a position they didn't plan to be in, I would probably say they'd go reasonably hard at it. Yeah, yeah. Column Lines Blind Spot says every single player on the treatment table at the moment will be playing for Clare versus Limerick first round. Lohan won't be able to resist. And my Woody either. I don't think any team is going to go out not put their best hand out unless there's a serious injury at risk. You know, you want to win every game in Munster until a progression is assured. So I think every team will be going all out to win every game, especially the first couple of rounds until they kind of feel out with the situations. Yeah, but the thing is about those guys that are on the treatment table, like I don't think, I don't think O'Donnell is on the treatment table. It's just really Kelly and, and Ryan Taylor. Who, Ryan Taylor seems to be making pretty swift progress by all accounts. He only got the operation. I remember chatting to him down to Galway races last year. He only got the operation after that. And that's what we're looking at, March now. So it was August to March. Like That's pretty swift progress looking like he could mm. feature and like wh why would brian lone resist like do you know what i mean you, you know 100 percent what you're going to get out of those guys even if they're not 100 percent on it you have a fair idea what you're going to get i don't think like sentiment kind of goes out the window a small bit when you're trying to get monster championship wins on the board if they are able to get result against limerick in the first game they're uh, it's obviously very competitive but they're half set up for the remainder of the campaign. I've said it to you before, that these guys that are coming in, it might necessarily be to start Munster Championship games this year, but it's the featuring games. They're, they will be far more better prepared to featuring games having played league. And it, it might be a championship start next year or the year after. That's sometimes the way it works. But why why would he resist? Like mm. You know what I mean? Shane O'Donnell hasn't played a game since the All-Ireland semi-final last year, but you know that he's going to be bouncing. There's no... There's no um, resisting anything. It's just you know what you're going to get from these players on a given day. So he's he'd be fully justified. And I'm sure that the younger fellas within the squad know that as well. They grew up idolising Shane O'Donnell and Tony Kelly. And they know that there's a place there for them whenever they're fit. But they're going to do their best to keep them out for as long as they can. 
Yeah, Cormac Quaid says, fierce early start, lads. Did you wet the bed? Uh, did you over there, the hotel, big swanky hotel over in Cheltenham? <laughs> Far from swanky. It's, uh, it, gets, it gets the job done now. I was down for the breakfast before I jumped on here. But uh, I don't think, uh, the first race to half one today, I don't think I'd be, I'd be, uh, I'd be able to do uh, a show here from a, busy pre- from a busy press room, as you say, with maybe with some lads poking their heads off each other in the background. <laughs> the, the, uh, would you be seeing many GEA heads over there? Yeah, lots actually. Um, was chatting to who was I chatting to the other night? Chatting Nigel Skeen from All Auckland Gales. He was involved with All Auckland this year. Kieran Kingston is around. Nicky English is around. Um, oh, there's lots of GA heads around. It's kind of I don't know racing and racing and GA kind of go kind of hand in hand really. And yeah, Kieran Morris from Mike Carkey Boris. I meet him in the hotel every year here. He's a former Tip Underage uh, star. Obviously, I would you meet you meet you meet a lot of people, yeah. Richard Hogan, avid follower of the show. I met him the other day. He I had my back turned and he kind of came up and frightened the PGs out me, to be honest with you. Um, but I was chatting to him. I didn't realize actually that he has a, a very successful balloon business. So if anyone around the southeast uh, area needs balloons, Richard Hogan, regular viewer of the show, is your man. Well, like what sort of balloons are we talking about for kids' parties, or are we talking hot air balloon? <laughs> well he ha- Richard has a lot of hot air himself now to be fair but um yeah no like you know the displays you'd see for could be for a christening or for a party or something like that you know you, or even for a wedding probably where you walk under balloons um Richard is your man there you go Richard I can't do any more for you than that so the R game followers are full of hot air who knew <laughs> who knew and the- and presenters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Column Lines Blind Spot. Tip Beat and Claire last year made a touch and go for Limerick to qualify from Munster. Can't see that happening this year. Will Limerick and Claire qualify a bit easier this time around? God, I wouldn't think so. I think it's every game's going to be puck of a ball again. The thing about that as well is um, Limerick were on the back foot for the rest of Munster because they had a defeat early. Was that the second yeah. game? So um, The first or the second game? The I, first I, game I, was Waterford, wasn't it? Yeah, so... The day of your if, wedding, of course. Yes, exactly. Yeah. If there's um if there's a winner of if there's a winner in that game, someone's on the back foot and someone's on the front foot. Do you know what I mean? You're you're on zero points and you can't afford to lose another game. If it's a draw, they're both in a half decent spot, but you're behind the eight ball if you lose that game. That's why that's why, you know. Tony Kelly won't have any match practice under his belt, which is a slight worry because I there's differences. You know the way there's differences between players. I think Shane O'Donnell will, will fit back in no problem because he's used to it. I think Kelly takes a couple of games to get going generally. Um, and he saw that a couple of years ago when he was coming back from an injury. So whether he'll be fully at the fo- at the pitch the first day, I'm not so sure. Limerick will definitely be at the pitch. I think they'll realise that. Even the Waterford game last year had them on the back foot. Claire put them further on the back foot, and then they were kind of scraping for you know inches the whole way until they got through. I think Limerick will be particularly targeting that game down in Cusick and trying to get two points on the board. And not that you can relax for the rest of the Munster, you definitely can't. But you put yourself in a decent spot. Mm. Yeah, do you know what your wedding was the year before? It was yes. the Wexford Limerick game and our Wexford yeah Waterford Limerick game first round. Trying to it watch was the Wall. Um, um, which you were watching on your phone and then put out a tweet that went kind of nuclear almost. It was like, <laughs> yeah, what, what was it? Something to do with like Waterford couldn't get it done when they had their strongest team out, and Limerick obviously had injuries. And didn't Keen Lynch go off injured in that game? Was it like it was like a huge failure or something like that? that yeah. I don't know, whatever I was saying. And then and you, you, you just you just sat back and watched your ass grow. <laughs> I did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Column Lines is back in again uh, saying, are we a small bit harsh on Clare to say they have to win something this year while at the same time saying Limerick are the greatest of all time? Doesn't seem fair for the Banner boys. But it's I think it's more that they have to win it because it's now or never. Because the age profile is getting very close to just going past. You know, it might spoil fairly soon. Yeah, no, like... Uh, sport is kind of cruel enough at times in the sense of, like, if Brian... And Brian Lone has done some brilliant things with Clare. Like, Dave whatever about the, the senior team, I think he's kind of universally agreed down there that he's kind of unified the county almost as well. And uh, like, can't get into the nuts and bolts of it, but he's done a hell of a lot of things behind the scenes that have helped completely lift the mood in Clare. But if if his fifth year is done and there's not something to show for it, and I, 
And that something can't just be, I'd say, running, you know, Limerick with an inch of their lives in the best Munster final of all time. It probably needs to be a little bit more than that. So, like a league title, a Munster title, obviously on All Ireland would be would be unbelievable. But getting something on the table would be very, very important in my view. Okay, I'm going to bring up, I kind of took a little bit, in, a, a few liberties here and filled out the table a small bit. We'll see what you make of it. I kind of took a few liberties and filled out the whole table without <laughs> conferring. <laughs> Limerick, Clare, Tipperary, uh, say you've been generous enough there. Tipperary, Kilkenny, Galway, Cork, Wexford, Dublin, Waterford. Um, there's no way I'd have, there's no way I'd have Dublin ahead of Waterford. And uh, I'd probably, I'd, I'd probably, I'd probably have Carlo ahead of Antrim as well, because Carlo are definitely going to be playing Division One hurling next year, and Antrim aren't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe, I just, I threw some of them in there as a little bit, little rogues, just to see how you'd react to them. To be fair, Carlo, are basically you thought I'd agree, and then you'd be like, oh no, 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 but what about this? Should they not be there? I think <laughs> like Antrim, Antrim of outside of that Dublin game have probably sh struggled a, a bit this year, and that's probably only natural with the with the players that they're missing. Well, well Carlo let, been brilliant into it. Mm, putting it, putting it like this, uh, like who's going to come out of Munster as far as you're concerned? Like, so I've nailed my colours to the mast there. Um, they'd probably be the three I would go for, as you'd say in the heat in the heel of the hunt. Yeah. Still, not not a hundred percent sure with Cork, and maybe things will start humming a bit better. And I, you know, I know to beat my own county, um, very very convincingly last weekend. But Cork will do that to inferior opposition. It's what they'll do to, or how they'll perform against opposition of a similar standard. That that is the worry, really. Um, so I would probably go with something similar. I'd probably go with the same tree as last year at the minute. Yeah, and like a comment here again from Colm Lines blind spot. Tip ahead of Kilkenny is questionable. Uh, Kilkenny are guaranteed an All Ireland uh, spot, Tipperary or not. And Sean O'Sullivan says, I predict what will be the first team out of Munster, out of the country, under holidays, while the rest of the teams are still in it. Um, Just Shane on that, Shane, as well, like yeah. I know Davey said the other day to, to judge Waterford on their championship and not their league. Like, if the championship doesn't go well, like, is, is that the like is that the end of the road? If the championship goes like, like it did last year and they're in 1B next year for 2025, like, he's under... He's, Probably put a bit of pressure on himself, I'd say, going into the championship. Um, and that that game against Cork is huge. You know, if Cork if Cork don't get a result there, they're really on the back foot coming up against the, the top three from last year in the remaining games. Similar from a Waterford perspective, if they don't get a result there, if you have a, if you have a two points on the board after that first game, you, you, you fancy your chances of getting something out of the last three games. Maybe a draw, maybe two draws, maybe a win against one of them. But if you're if you're coming into those uh, next three games against, you know, the three that came out last year with zero points, you're under big pressure. Like, so I've put three Munster teams, one, two and three here, because I think that no matter who comes through, a Munster team is going to win the All-Ireland. So I think you can justifiably do that. Limerick, I fancy to win Munster, come through straight to semi-final. And I do think Kilkenny will probably win Munster again, even though I, a bit like, you know, we're talking about... Leinster, Jesus, Kilkenny win a Munster would be a sight now. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I don't think that that would be possible even if they were in it. But like, I do think that um, the way we're talking about Clare, that it's now or never, I feel the same about Galway. So like, they really should go and win Mon Leinster this year. I'm not saying that they definitely will or anything like that, but it's, a it's year three for Henry Shefflin. They have plenty of quality players. Like They have to get it done at this stage, but I don't know, like, and obviously they beat Tipperary last year. Don't get me wrong; I'm fully aware of that they do have a lot of quality on a given day. But can they back it up? And the way they faded out against Limerick in the semi final, lots of teams do that. Don't get me wrong; Limerick do that to everybody. But I don't know; they sh they should be pushing a lit. Like, yeah, what what do you think yourself? Like, they should be pushing Kilkenny at this stage. Oh, should, they should be winning Leinster the last couple of years, but they they haven't. Um, let, let's call a spade a spade. This isn't exactly a golden. Kilkenny team either it's a Kilkenny team that would perform to a level most days but it's not a golden team like imagine you'd said that after Galway beat uh, after Galway beat Kilkenny fairly convincingly in that Leinster final replay down in Turles in 2018 that they wouldn't have won another Leinster title since like it's bizarre really like for the talent for the talent that they have like and yeah like they're 
if Henry doesn't get like an Leinster title on the board this year, and which would clear a path through to an All Ireland semi final as well to potentially avoid Limerick until a final if they were to get there, he's under a bit of pressure as well because uh, it's one thing saying like and him signing for another couple of years or whatever. But they need to. There needs to be get something tangible on the board, and they don't have anything at the minute, and that's a worry. And like Dotty Burke's not going to be around forever. David Burke's not going to be around forever. Connor Cooney's not going to be around from forever. Um. Like Johnny Glynn's not going to come back from the States or rejoin the squad forever as well. Like these are things that are have a very, very short window, I would say. So they need to make hay now too. Like it's essentially like looking at the Galway team, it's still the bulk of that 2017 team. Like that's that's seven years ago now. Um uh, to say they've added very little in terms of silver since then is very disappointing from their regard. And there is a bit of pressure on this year. Um they had a Leinster title in their grasp last year, let it slip. Um it's just it's frustrating because you know the talent is there. That's the, that's the really if we put if we put Galway's first fifteen down on paper, it, it matches up unbelievably favourably with any other team in the country. But they just haven't been getting the results. Yeah, Paul Young says Clare can't perform at Croke Park for whatever reason. Shane Power says you can't have Kilkenny ahead of Tip. Tip haven't done anything in nearly five years. Whereas Kilkenny have been in two All Irelands in a row. Here's my question: Is is that argument solely based on? Kilkenny are in the weaker province. So, I mean, if they were to come up head-to-head, who, who do I think will win this year? I think Tipperary would win if they go head-to-head in knockout championship. And also, I think Tipperary will get through. So that that's why I would have Tipperary ahead of them. But it's not that Tipperary have done a load in the last few years. Um, do you want to settle that one off, just in terms Will we square that one off? Or do you, are you still thinking Kilkenny should be ahead? I, I tell you what, I haven't been exactly too impressed with what I've seen with Kilkenny so far this year either um seems to be a bit of a there's a there's a fairly um a fairly strong concern amongst Kilkenny folk as well about probably the lack of cohesiveness in their play what way they're actually playing um that they're going back to the well with similar players in similar positions maybe that haven't worked in big games over the last couple of years like Mikey Carey slipped in I think number six the, the last day a uh, very good player I don't know if he's you know, an obvious number six though, really. Um, and it'd be interesting to see who they play there at the weekend. Um, Limerick have probably got a bit of joy out with Richie Reid the last couple of years. Kilkenny haven't had a settled midfield pair. And there's a fair few question marks. Um, they have been in all Ireland finals the last two years though. So I, I would still have them. I would still have them ahead of tip based on what they've done. They beat Clare, be Clare in the last two all Ireland semi-finals. They're going for five in a row in Leinster. Um, would Tip be going for five in a row in Leinster? Most certainly not. Um, and would Tip have made an All Ireland final last year, even from Leinster? Most certainly not. Um, be clear in the championship. They, they did, yeah. There was a few caveats with that now. <laughs> yeah, but that's because Tipperary ran out of road energy wise. If they were going through Leinster, they can sort of use their panel far more. Yeah, may, maybe so. They, they definitely wouldn't have done Check five. In a row. They definitely wouldn't have done five in a row in Leinster because twenty twenty two was an absolute. Uh, what did they call it? Anis Horribilis? Is that what they say? Um, they, definitely wouldn't, they definitely wouldn't have done I five think I had one of those after a bad curry, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just... Um, I still have Kilkenny ahead of Tipperary based on what they've done in Championship for the for the last four, three, four years, I'd say. Okay, then what about uh, Wexford, Dublin, Cork, Watford? Um, I the same question still remain with Cork at the minute. I'd be, I'd be happy enough with, with where they are. I'd I'd say if they played Wexford in a championship game, I'd probably be still fancying Cork to narrowly win that game. Um, if Cork played Galway, yeah, I'd probably be still be fancying Galway to narrowly beat them like they did in twenty twenty two. Just yeah, there's um, there's a few question marks hanging over Cork again going into going into this year's championship and. I think the lack of consistency is definitely uh would definitely be a worry for me anyway, just thinking like if you are to confidently, you know, think Cork are gonna get out gonna get out of Munster, just like on their day they can go toe to toe with anybody and can cut loose on anybody, but on their day they can also not show up and you know, be very, very I don't know, flaky is the word, but you're not hundred percent sure what you're gonna get at a given time. Yeah, Dublin got to an All-Ireland quarter-final last year. Didn't go well against Clare, obviously. But the feeling this year with... Like, they have Chris Crummy back, but 
you know, Keen Boland is gone, Chris O'Leary is gone. They have a couple of injuries. If they come right, they'll still be strong for championship. But there is a feeling that they'll probably slip behind Wexford this year. Do you still feel that, like, in terms of talent, I think Watford should definitely be ahead of Dublin. But it's just the way it's going at the moment. And just Dublin's prospects in Leinster should be that bit stronger. I thought the last time we did this that we were taking the provinces out of it. Or am I, am I thinking of something else? And we kind of were, but sure, look, this is a fluid thing. <laughs> very, very. It's like the game now. If positions are fluid. You can play oh, anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I still have Waterford ahead of, I still have Waterford ahead of Dublin all day, twice on Sunday. Now, if, if you're talking about in terms of, in terms of talent, I don't, I don't think it would look right to have Dublin ahead of Waterford, been, on, been honest with you. But Wexford would be. Wexford would be yeah, and obviously beat them, beat them only. Is that last weekend? Weekends are merging into one now at this stage. It was yeah. last weekend, yeah. Um, and the Wexford are undefeated as well. I wouldn't be losing the run of yourself with Wexford either, you know, and you know putting them up three or four or something based on what we've seen so far. But you know, I think I think Waterford people looking at the Wexford game on Sunday. We were chatting John Milan the other day, and he was just saying. There was a degree of envy from Waterford people looking at how Wexford were playing the other day. Just how, like, they put up 223 the other day. Wexford put up 223 the other day without Lee Chin. Like, that's actually... Or like, Rory O'Connor. Yeah, and obviously there's plenty of... Uh, and Conor McDonald and Lee Mogg McGovern. You know, Jack, that's, Jack O'Connor. Yeah, like, that's really, really promising for, again, not just this year, but the years to come as well, to know that they are... And I think Darry Egan deserves a bit of credit because he blooded a lot of the guys that are kind of thriving now, much like Parik Fannin did in Waterford in 2019. And it might not have went well, but a lot of those guys were the mainstays in 20 when they got to the final in 21, when they got to the semi-final. But you'd have to say, from a Wexford point of view, it does look it does look promising. Um, I think they're themselves and Limerick are the only two unbeaten teams in the country at the minute. If um, So we're both kind of saying that we think uh, Tip will get out of Munster. If both Tip and Kilkenny get out of their province, who's more likely to win in All Ireland this year? And I'll add in the same with Galway. Throw the three of those into the mix because it's the order of them three that's causing us the issue here. Um, who's more likely to win the All Ireland? Um, well, that that's where the the provincial thing probably does come in. You're probably thinking, I no, think if all it, three get out, so that takes the provincial thing out of it. Yeah, but it, it, but if all three get out, I'd say Tipperary are getting out in third place, and then they're playing a preliminary, and then they're playing a quarter final, and then they're playing a semi final. Where but think generally, the preliminary is a bit of a non event. For okay. when it, if someone like Tipperary or Cork or Clare or Limerick are in it anyway, it's still another game, and then they have to play a quarter final, and then so to me, they're going a longer passage. I would say to to get through. Like I'd still, you're saying Galway, you know, should win Leinster this year. I'd probably still have Kilkenny as favourites to win Leinster realistically. Because they seem to be able to get the job done, so that would put them in a, a, a kind of a direct route through. Whereas Tipper, Tipperary are going to have to go maybe a more convoluted route and could find a very very tricky quarter final like they did last year against Galway. Who's who's more likely to win the All Ireland? Um, I would say Kilkenny are more likely to win the All Ireland than Tipperary. Okay, you've made a compelling case with the with the longer route if Tipperary don't get into the top three. And to be honest, look, I think it's going to be a puck of a ball. Cork could get through as well if they come right at the right time. It could be them as well. So you're some yoke. You put Tipperary in three, and it didn't take that much of an argument for me to get them down to five. <laughs> I know. Look, to be fair, I do think quality wise, if Tipperary were to come up against, um, and I know you can definitely point to Galway having a good record against Tip in recent times. I think if Tip come up against Galway or Kilkenny in the championship this year, and there isn't a raft of injuries, if both teams come in fully loaded, sorry, if, whether it's uh, Galway or Kilkenny, I think Tipperary would win this year. Okay. Okay, fair, fair enough. Yeah. But for the moment, you, you make a coherent argument, which I don't always say, to be, <laughs> to be fair. I'm usually not the most coherent, to be fair. No. <laughs> uh, well, look, this weekend, uh, Kilkenny are up against Waterford. I think, I think just for confidence and the way things have been going, Davy Fitz would love a victory here. And, you know, it's the near neighbours and all that kind of stuff. And for so long, Waterford were almost like on the hind tit when it came up to when it came to games against Wexford, or sorry, what, or Kilkenny, wasn't it from 1959 to 2017 they hadn't beaten them in the championship? They're doing a little bit better in more recent times. There was that COVID semi-final that Watford won from a mile behind. But I think it would be a big boost to Watford, given how they've been going to win this game. I think both teams need to win this game, do they not? 
Um, well, I think it's, Kenny have only lost one game out of four. They've got five points. Yeah, but it's kind of been the, the nature of the performances. Like, Kenny people chatting to plenty of different, you know, people down around there, like, they were half disgusted with the first half against Offaly. Like, it was terrible. Um, against Claire, against Claire the other day, they, you know, have some of their big hitters back. They have TJ back. They have Paddy Deegan back. 16 points on the board against, against Claire with plenty of probably refereeing decisions going their way at different times as well. And... I just think they probably, well, they need a result, I would say, but they need a bit of a performance as well. And you need people, I think people down there want to see a bit more evidence of how they're, I don't know if it's how they're evolving, but they definitely don't look like, they definitely don't look like they're taken to this kind of shorter style with any great degree of flair shall we say it doesn't look particular it doesn't look good when they play that way and when it breaks down it looks absolutely terrible at times so i don't know if they're going to persist with that or they're going to maybe revert back to something maybe more traditional that we've seen but at times they're probably from what i've seen anyway they're the least adept to play that style at the minute um mm. and it's a bit yeah just the general mood is is not great and it's funny Derek Ling would have gotten a pass in the in the first year and they won Leinster obviously and got to an all Ireland final. There'll be less of a pass this year, so there is there is a good bit more pressure on. And I think going into you know, what are we looking at? That they're probably they have a good chance of securing league semi final place if they if they win if they win at the weekend. Then you have a chance to turn your form around, as they did probably last year somewhat when they beat Cork in that semi final. And I know they were brushed aside by Limerick in the final, but they're mm. giving themselves more games to be ready for I think God was the second game in Leinster this year. So Kilkenny would benefit by getting a couple of more competitive games, getting more time into TJ, getting more time into Paddy Deegan, etc. So I think it's important for both teams to get a result at the weekend. Davy needs to the mood is sh- the mood has shifted back in Waterford a small bit. And even just reading through some of the comments there, he kind of called for a bit of time and a bit of patience after last year's championship give us give us a bit of time and we'll you know we'll be fine come whatever but the results haven't really backed that up and people want to see something now um so i think it's imperative that both both get results at the weekend who do i think will actually win the game i'd say kenny are the more likely of the two to win the game you just want a team where you can get behind them and try and understand what they're doing like and this is why you know in relative terms i'm very much behind what lean cattle is doing with tipperary because i can see what they're trying to do for the most part, now I, I want to see what they do with the centre back spot. But for the most part, I'm like, okay, that makes sense to me. I can see why you're doing that, bringing through that player, giving him a go, bringing in more physicality. I get it. So and they're getting stuck in with Watford. I just don't fully know what they're trying to do. And you know, Niall Moran was on talking about it a couple of weeks ago, or it was a week and a half ago, or something. And he was talking about like it's it's a real rabbit out of the hat stuff. And you might have the ten bad performances, and then one day it all clicks, and will that make up for it? Um, but ju- just to go back to you, what you're saying about Kilkenny and the short game, does it suit them? And I'm watching, I, I just looked at the team they picked up against Cork and the back line. If you're going to be playing short, often it's coming out short through the back. So, like, does it suit, let's say, Mikey Butler, Hugh Lawler, Tommy Walsh, David Blanchfield, Dara Corcoran, Shane Murphy? And obviously, there's plenty of other players you can pick and, and throw into that as well. But just for the sake of argument, I've picked that game against Cork. Is is it that the players they have don't suit running it through the lines? There's probably a bit in that as well, I'd say. Um, there's probably a bit, like I would say, like Hugh, definitely it would suit Hugh Lawler, it would suit Mikey Butler. They're, it's, they're pretty comfortable on the ball from the back. Tommy Walsh probably to to, to a lesser extent, maybe. Um, Dara Corkin would have generally played a more traditional style with, with Ballyhale, where it was a lot more direct. And even like, I remember watching the game against the Borough last year and even the the county final it's it is a direct game most of the time like it's a long ball and we have we have the players to win it up the other end so uh, you know I, I kind of would agree with you i think you have to you do have to cut your claw to to what you have like as i said to you before if you have two six or four forwards that can catch ball you play a more direct style if you if you have five foot ten forwards that are very very pacey you know, you try to play a style that suits them. You try and get the ball to the ground. You don't bombard them with high balls. So I think you have to play to to what you have. Um, you know, from chatting people in Kilkenny as well, and you know, Nicky would probably, Nicky Brennan would probably have more information on this, but there would be a bit of, um, how should we say, 
there wouldn't be much heart taken from the underage work or the lack of underage success that's gone on in recent years. And it, you know, I know from chatting a lot of people that they think they're now what's the opposite of bearing fruit? They're now they're not Will reaping on the vine. <laughs> Maybe that's kind of what's happening now that if you don't sow the seeds, you know, there's nothing to, you don't reap anything in a couple of years time. So that's, I know that that's a worry uh, on North side. And I think you have to play with what you have. Um, and I don't know, like I, I, I don't, Kenny aren't going to beat Limerick playing like Limerick. I'll put it to you that way. Other, other teams can mirror Limerick a lot better than Kilkenny. So I don't know. You're not going to change. You're hardly going to change tack mid-season either, though. So I'd imagine they're going to persist with it. Yeah, a couple of good comments here from Adrian McGrath, Clare man. Kilkenny were beaten by a very new look Clare team last Sunday. Finished the match with seven or eight players that won't start versus Limerick. And then another very good point here regarding Limerick. I missed the start. So what is the thinking if Hayes isn't available and Hannon can't get back to 2022 levels? That half back line is their engine room up to this. So Kyle Hayes will be facing sentencing very, very soon. And I mean, Carl O'Neill can go back there, Colin Coughlin. I mean, some people question, you know, is he quick enough and all that kind of stuff. And one thing I would have said, the game against Tipperary is probably the worst possible day for somebody who's of his size. And, you know, if if kind of turning quickly isn't kind of your main thing, it was probably the worst possible type of day for him. And a lot of the championship games are going to be at the height of summer. And I suppose for a big man, that presents a different challenge because the pace in that heat during the summer, you know, there's a question mark over that. They can, of course, put Barry Nash there. If Sean Finn comes right, they can put Dan Morrissey there. So no matter what they do, they're still going to be a fearsome proposition. Oh, they are, of course. Um, and I, the thing about Carl O'Neill is, I think it's funny, it's all, it's grand, I'd say, when he's going forward. I don't know if he has those defensive instincts, shall we say. This, you know, was it um, was it Nisha that was saying on Monday show? I just saw the headline coming out um, that you need a def- you know you need a real defender at six. And yeah, you have to be a defender first. Yeah, yeah, you do, and you do like it's it's grand going forward. I just thought even at times was he caught in possession against Tipperary a couple of times and was turned over, and all of a sudden there's a bit of a, a hole at the back. Um, like I think I think Willow Dunne who does have those defensive instincts because that's the way he plays even at midfield. So like uh, I think when push comes to shove, if they're going to need to put someone at six in the championship and it's not Declan Hannon, I think it will be Willow Donahue because, or as Eddie Brennan calls him, Willie Donahue, um, <laughs> because he has that kind of defensive instinct first. He will mine the house first and he won't leave any kind of gaping holes. Like Limerick were turned over a couple of times. Like Cotland was turned over against, uh, against Bonner the other day and it was quite open for him to come through. Jake Morris's goal was quite open as well. It was a turnover. But even if the ball is kind of, you do lose the ball. There probably should still be guys back there to make sure that they don't stall them through to the defence like they should. So they're, they're, they have options, but I, I think they'll probably still go back to what they know if Hannon is out and if Hayes is unavailable. Yeah, Barry Murphy, I thought, was really impressive against Tipperary, particularly in the first half. But I don't think they can take, afford to take Willow Dunhu out of midfield because he's just, obviously he's very good at winning rock ball. But every time he gets possession, he's always finding somebody. And generally, like... I mean, if it's on, he'll take the person running forward. But generally, he turns around and he pops it to some player who's got the full picture in front of him. And often it's Dermot Burns and he fires in a laser into somebody. I don't know if you can if you can sort of move him back to centre back, throw someone else in midfield and have the same level of understanding between the different lines of the pitch. Oh, you probably you probably won't. But I, I think they'll feel they have to do what they have to do. Like, you know, I think they have four or five probably real live options for the full back line now. One of the comments there was saying like Dan Morrissey would probably just slip back out to seven if if they need if needs be and it'll be would say it'll be Finn, Casey, um Barry Nash in the full back line. They'll just rejig the pieces a small bit. Don't think they'll weaken the lines. Um I don't think they'll weaken the lines too much. Um but I would see Willow Dunhu starting at six if, if Hannon is not fit to start. Yes, it does weaken the midfield area a small bit could see Keen Lynch coming into midfield. You could see Cotton O'Neill reverting back to the forward line. Um, like you mentioned about fluidity, like they are pretty fluid. Like they'll weaken a line a small bit, but the overall kind of collective or the team will still be very, very strong. Are you concerned about Offaly going to visit uh, Clare this weekend? It's in Bar actually. Uh, oh, sorry, it's in, the yeah. home of Ireland. 
Yeah, first ever you know, Ireland, first ever All Ireland final played there. Shane, first ever All Ireland club final played there as well. There was All Ireland semi finals played there back in the day in the seventies as well. Um, am I concerned? Uh, I wouldn't be con- wouldn't be as concerned as it would have been last weekend. And I was concerned when they went out to Kilkenny as well because I just thought Kilkenny have traditionally opened up against us. Uh, you know, we were missing a couple of lads the other day. Awfully just can't afford to be missing the likes of. Keel and Kylie and kind of big hitters like that, and they were missing David King for the Kilkenny game. Kind of need everyone. Um, I, I I would look at that game last Sunday and think Cork can do will do that to weaker teams, and they were always likely to do that to us. But if you look at the league as a whole overall, it's been quite positive. If they can finish with something um, at the weekend that's competitive at least, and it's not a route like I, I mentioned it to you before. Just conceding like five goals, like it just it's a it's a bad look and it's a bad feel when you're at a game. It's a bad feel when you're on the pitch. Whereas Kilkenny beat them by seven and it was one twenty six. Do you know what I mean? That's not bad. That's a typical scoreline that you would concede. But and I think um, you but you kept going to the end against probably Kilkenny and then I mean somewhat understandably maybe lads just faded entire you know whatever it might be against Cork. Cork piled on the scores in garbage time as well and put a bad look on it. But I, I was saying on Monday to, to Nisha and Tom Dempsey, I think he might have talked about it as well, but there's a real balance for Johnny Kelly there at the moment. He, of course, wants to bring through these young lads, but then like physically they're you know, probably outmatched a nice bit by the likes of Cork, who have big players, clear, big physical players. Like It's a tough balance for him to, you know, to find when do I throw these lads out. And to some degree, he probably needs bodies because everyone has injuries. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and like we we don't have the strength and depth that other teams have. I was just chatting to somebody um that was down on pitch level the other day, and he just said Cork were preparing two or three lads to come in, and there was two or three awfully lads coming in around a similar time or warming up, and he just said like the the physical difference, and like Cork aren't the biggest team in the world, and he just said the physical difference, the conditioning, the difference in conditioning levels between the Cork lads and the awfully lads are kind of poles apart, and I know that was probably seen in the the twenty final last year that. Like we've a bit of catch up to play in in that regard, and it is a balancing act for Johnny Kelly. Like I said it to someone the other day, and they were kind of half shocked when I said it. Like I, we are far from like anything but guaranteed getting out of the McDonough, and we're not guaranteed to get into a McDonough final either. Mm. You know, yeah. um, far from it because it's so competitive. Like Leash will have the bit between their teeth after missing out last year and feeling aggrieved by the way that that last game against Offaly went. Westmead are, are dropping down as well. Like that's three into two doesn't go like, do you know what I mean? So it wouldn't be that much of a surprise if 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 we miss out. Um, and Johnny obviously has that bit of a balancing act as well, which I think, I do think it's imperative that the under 20s, I don't know, I, I would still be giving those under 20s the preference of the under 20. I think that should be their main goal once it hits April and May. Because if you look at what, the run of the minors, the run of the twenties is done for the county in the last couple of years. I would still be giving them first preference to play their own code first because I think that's with the longer kind of term development of the county in in, in mind. But you're going to ship defeats like you shipped last Sunday. That's just the nature of it. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Is it Dublin and Leash that awfully have in their under twenty group? I actually haven't seen the channel to be honest with you. I haven't. Um, I haven't. I, like Leash would have been. The beat leash in the minor two years ago, so that's going to be that's going to be tough, obviously. Um, and the I think the beat Dublin in the semi final last year, so that's going to be. I'm tough I'm just well, looking maybe. it up here. Yeah, no, sorry. Um, group one is Offaly, Dublin, Galway. Group two is Wexford, Kilkenny, Leash. Yeah, so it was actually Galway rather than Leash. Yeah, like, harder, harder again. Like really, realistically, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but to be fair, that, that Leash team, I suppose a lot of that Leash team got to that minor uh, Leinster final against you a couple of years ago. Uh, Vernie, do you think Offaly would have a much better chance of winning under 20 now that they have another year at it and a year ahead on S&C work, etc.? says Shane Power. It's the vast, vast majority of the panel from last year. Um, so I, I would think so. I would I, You would think so, but like things kind of maybe fell into place a bit, a bit last year and even with... Galway missing was a Gavin Lee they were missing for that game and even like Billy Drennan and Timmy Clifford and these boys not playing the knockout game for Kilkenny it mightn't fall into place like that this year and they might have a awfully could pick up a couple of injuries or whatever but 
you're probably thinking conditioning wise they should be in a better spot this year than they than they were last year. But sometimes it just falls for you. Like awfully won the Leinster final last year with 14 men for the bulk of the second half. You could have 15 men in in a game in a game this year and, might, and it mightn't fall for you as well as it fell for us. And Wexford are probably shot themselves in the foot that day as well. So that's why it's so important to win that Leinster title a minor when you're there and win the All Ireland obviously when you're there as well. And we didn't do that. Uh, would you have to take the chances that come in front of you? It mightn't fall maybe as well this year as it did last year. Hmm. Adrian McGrath, PS, public apology for Nisha. Uh, Peter Duggan gets so much SH1T, even from own supporters. I'm a hair trigger when backing him. Yeah, <laughs> I think Nisha was trying to be, you know, showing both sides of it the other day. And, you know, Adrian was a bit touchy on it. Uh, to be fair play to you, Adrian. John O'Kinnon says, and he kind of answers his own question, would we, be, would we be better in Joe Mack for two to three years and chase the under 20? A worthwhile development sacrifice, in my opinion, in terms of development. And John Collins also has 20 teams off in peak a year earlier than the minor group did. Just an observation. And this weekend, Cork are against Wexford. So there's plenty at stake there because Cork are on, let me see, they're on four points. Wexford are on five points. So just in terms of the per permutations, that's one point behind uh, Kilkenny, which is the same as Wexford. So a win away to Wexford for Cork and a Kilkenny loss would put them through to a semi-final, would put Cork through to a semi-final. Now, if it ends up being a case that Wexford win, Kilkenny win, and let's say Offaly win up at uh, Clare, or sorry, up in Burr against Clare, then it would be a three-way tie and it would go to that scoring difference. And it's very tight with the scoring difference at the moment. But to be fair, you know, Clare are probably going to win that game. So, I mean, th there's a good chance here for Wexford or Cork if Watford can somehow get the job done against Kilkenny. And I, there was a good tweet, actually, by uh, Dennis Hurley of the Cork Echo. And he was saying that this is the El Martico. Aina Martin, who won a Cork Senior Hurling Championship under Pat Ryan with Sarsfields in 2012, is a Wexford selector, while his brother Trelock is part of the Cork stats team, which is a mad one. That's gas, yeah. It's not too often brothers face brothers um on the sideline. It's becoming maybe more of a maybe more of a, a thing that could be more common in time and clubmates facing off against clubmates. We've seen it on the sideline, obviously, with uh with Tony McEntee and Ushi McConville, uh, and obviously with Willie Marr and Liam Cattle as well, with with Leash and Tip, but that's a mad one. Brothers against brothers, yeah. Um Aina transferred down to Sarsfields. Ah, he was still in the middle of his Still in the middle of his Wexford career. Um, I think he was uh, he's heavily involved, obviously, in Wexford GA or had been anyway, um, in the background uh, as regards operations manager and stuff like that. Even though I see I think they've uh, I think they've appointed a new one in recent times, but that's a that's a funny one, definitely. Yeah. Um I'm sure Aina would have plenty of information on the Cork lads and would have would be seeing plenty of what's going on at club level there as well. But uh yeah, brother versus brother is a good one. It's like Kane and the Undertaker. Have you noticed that part of one of the members of the backroom team of for Watford has to be Barry Cocklett's brother? There's a guy, I just saw it in the background, and I was like, two cheeks and one arse there, that has to be his brother. I'm not. I'm fairly sure Nisha said it to me as well, Nisha Waldron, uh, that that's his brother. But anyway, much ado about nothing really talk about that. But um, Cork last year, they came from, I'm pretty sure came from well behind to beat Wexford. And it was late scores that got them over the line. And I think we were talking to maybe John Myler at the time, who'd been saying that for a number of years, Cork weren't winning tight games and that this was maybe a new departure under um, Pat Ryan, that a couple of games in the league last year, they did win in tight situations. So maybe that was a, a sign of good things to come. Column Lines blind spot says, lads, Cork will batter Wexford. I think their style is a nightmare for them. What do you think? Um, I, I don't know. I think um, I, I like the way Wexford are playing at the minute now, I have to say. Um, I like the way they're playing. They're they're easy on the eye. It's there's obviously a structure to it, but it's not. They're not kind of straight jacketed to a particular structure, as in sweeper wise or anything like that. They don't generally leave themselves too open at the back either. Um, Cork, yeah, like Cork style would be not not good for someone like an Offaly or something like that against weaker opposition. I don't necessarily know if Wexford are weaker opposition at the minute. I don't. I don't. I don't think they are. Expect, I actually expect that to be tight enough, I'd say. Mm. And um, Alan Connolly was talking after scoring a hat-trick against Offaly the last day, and he goes, look, ah, look, I probably haven't been fit the past three years. I've been injured, carrying something. It's kind of great to play with a bit of freedom. You can see out there, I hope I look a bit freer anyway. 
kind of the mind at ease anyway. It's kind of hard carrying the injuries. Thankfully, now I'm over it. Uh, everything is fine, thank God. I have the physios to thank there, Sinead Murphy and Colm Coakley, so I'm delighted to be back playing, playing with freedom. I've been in a dark place the past three years, I'd say. like My mind is at ease. It's just great coming to train and not worrying about your shoulder or anything like that. And, you know, I saw Christy O'Connor's stat in the Cork Echo that Cork created 10 goal scoring chances uh, that last day. If they keep feeding that ball to Alan Connolly, sure, even three or four years ago before all the injury issues, and he's still only 22, like he does, he is the real deal, or he certainly looks like the real deal in there if they can get enough ball to him. Ah, seriously dangerous player, yeah. And like, very honest of him there, um, saying about be, being in a dark place. Injuries are just a horror show, particularly if it's something maybe that you're not used to growing up or it's something that you haven't been exposed to. It's very, very difficult to get your head around. I think I've developed um, plantar fasciitis in the last couple of days. I swear you, to God, you. I'm in absolute bits. I got a kind of a heel raise off a fella yesterday. It gave me a bit of a, gave me a bit, a bit of comfort. But if you st- well, that's you st- your inferiority complex over your height, though. Shady <laughs> Mac, I'm not just I'm not tidy or anything. Definitely not. But um, it's um, when you sit down and have a mood for an hour and you try to get up. Oh my God, you'd be in bits. It's when you're walking around on it. It's not too bad because you just get used to the pain. But it's almost like it subsides when you're sitting down. Then when you get up and we cover about 20,000 steps a day, I'd say, going up and down to the parade ring and up and down. You're flying around and I walk up and down to the race course every day. But injuries are tough. And I had my own I had my own bad enough injuries throughout my own, my own career. And it can totally get into your head. Like, and like it's gas. Like, I remember thinking, it's oftentimes you'd be injured coming in training. And it, if you're not used to injury, you kind of maybe don't think too much about it. But when you've had several injuries, if you're going into training, you'd be kind of thinking, you'd nearly be thinking everybody's looking at you. And judging you and saying like, why is this lad? What's this lad doing? He's injured again. And it's not. It's that's not reality at all. And because people are, especially nowadays, people are so consumed with themselves that they're not thinking about anybody else generally. But it can really get in on you. And I'm sure a lot of people, like Alan Connolly, was probably trying to nearly avoid people at different stages because you don't want to have that same conversation. How is the injury going, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But like he still has another. He's ten years in a cork shirt if he stays fit. Um, and he doesn't like I know Offley was probably a bit of a, a false picture maybe of where he is at the minute but definitely looks like he's on the way back anyway and Cork need lads like that he's a bit a bit of an X factor to him and he's a little bit different maybe than some of the players that they already have so if they can keep him fit he's a huge weapon for them for this year yeah like himself and Horgan inside would be a fairly tasty duo because you can let a ball in any which way into Connolly and you need someone who's athletic, who's big, strong, fast, who kind of has it all, really, to deal with him. Uh, Boom Boom 43 says, go on, Shane, tell us what height he is. I'd say about 5'9 in heels. 5'9, me I. 5'10 and a half. In your socks. <laughs> That's like, <laughs> I don't even know if I should say it. You know that, you know that, uh, that thing from that quote from Liar Liar? It's like, yeah, in your bra. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Antrim are against Tipperary this weekend and I like if you look at the last couple of years I think Tipperary in 2022 the time they scored seven goals there might have been was it 28 points in it that day 29 maybe last year it was 18 points to both teams this was in Corrigan Park they were much changed and look Tipperary do need scoring difference if it turns out that Galway beat Limerick, which seems somewhat unlikely given some of the suspensions Dahi Burke and Conor Whelan. If Galway were to beat Limerick, Tipperary would need to win by probably 30 plus points to get through. I don't think that's going to happen, but Tipperary do have a motivation to put up a big score here. Um, And from Liam Cass' point of view, if you're not guaranteed a league semi-final, he probably does want to see his best team out there again. So there is concern here for, for Antrim of conceding a big score. There is, of course. Um, it's obviously Darren Gleeson coming up against his, his native county as well. Um, I know it's maybe less relevant towards league action, but you know how, are, how will Tip be bouncing after the, the Limerick game? And I know they made it respectable on the scoreboard at the end, but you know physically it'd be interesting to see they would nothing left the week after they played Limerick in championship last year when they, when they played Waterford. Um, it's league, so it should be different. But it'll be interesting to see whether they're hopping, you know, as well as they were maybe against Galway a month or, a month or so ago. And will it have taken? Will it have taken much out of them? Yeah, you weren't on the show on Monday. What What did you make of the Limerick Tipperary game? Like broad strokes, what What's your takeaway? 
Um, I thought it was a bit of a battering, to be honest. Okay. I thought it was a bit of a battering. Um, take two goals that came against the run of play from unforced errors. And I, I just thought Tip were... Forced error. Nah. I, I, I tell you what, Colin Coughlin won't, won't be going down for a ball without protecting himself. I'd say ever again. That 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 sort of thing will not be allowed to happen. And I'd say, being honest, I'd say it's a black mark against him. Um, that it was a bit of naivety. And like Bonner's the best in the business at coming in. He's probably the best, he's probably the best defender as regards attackers in the game, maybe ever. Like I've seen I saw him in a college's final, um, and he just went up and down the, p- the field hooking and blocking all day. And it was just actually a joy to watch. But like it, that was a, a mistake, I would say, from Coughlin. It was a mistake, I think, from for Tom Morrissey for the, the the other goal. I just don't see that happening again. I'd say Kylie was actually bullying um with the, with those mistakes because they let they probably could have won by seven or eight, but I just thought Tip had no uh, no options in the last twenty minutes. It, it, just, it didn't look. I just I was looking at it, I was thinking, where are these scores going to come from? They can't even get the ball inside at the minute, uh, and Limerick were just at their ease, kind of popping points over the bar. Um, and it was respectable on the scoreboard, but I thought like it's probably a one point hammer. And realistically, in my, in my view, just just looking at it, um, but they've done that. They've done that to everyone. Was it Colin Keys had the stat? So the guts of like uh, is it been minus plus twenty six in the yeah in, in the yeah. thirteen games Tipper plus twenty six in the first half and Limerick are plus seventy four in the second half. Yeah, like isn't that they're fair figures. Now that's just that's not just against Tipperary, but. Uh, I, I thought I thought Limerick at, at their ease and after a terrible first half, like Dermot Burns would say, for example, wasn't on it in the first half at all. Once the threat of, you know, potentially losing a game or being under pressure in a game came to the fore, I thought they raised it a couple of gears and there was still probably a couple of gears in them, to be honest with you. Your hatred of Tipperary never fails to surprise. <laughs> I'm only messing with you. Uh, I'm, 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 re- I'm a realist. I'd say you're the, the ultimate optimist when it comes to Tipperary. And yeah. uh, I just, uh, I, I, fair, fair play to you. Like the, the final whistle was only gone about five or 10 minutes, and you were already writing essays on Twitter <laughs> just, yeah. just, just, just to find why this is a great result for Tipperary. And yeah, stoking the fires. Yeah, but like, uh, and I kind of referenced this in a way that, you know, the last couple of minutes can make or break, you know, how things are shaped going forward. Offaly against Cork, like yeah. giving up those two goals of a shot, geez, it puts a real dirty look on it. Whereas Tip getting that goal, that 1-1 towards the very end of the game, rather than Limerick continuing to pull away from you, as they do with every team. Like, look at the All-Ireland semi-final and final last year. Galway and Kilkenny couldn't raise a gallop in that last 20 minutes. Whereas at least Tip kept coming. That's the way I'd look at it, that, you know, Tip need to be submerged for 70 minutes against Limerick, see how they do, try and do better the next time, the next time, the next time. Like if you lo- have that 16-point turnaround in 2021, then you lost the last quarter, maybe 2-8 to 4 in 2022. Last year, drew the game. This year, lose league semi-final, but you're going all the way to the end. That's that's the way I'm looking at it. I'm not saying the Tipperary will stop the drive for five. I think Limerick will complete the drive for five. But I'm just saying there's little steps within that where you can say, okay, right, there's something there. Hundred percent. You can hang your hat on something like that. <clears> that <throat> we didn't uh, that we didn't raise the white flag, and that's that's huge. It no, it is important because you go back into training on Tuesday night, having been beaten by seven or eight, and your final score is what? Let's just say it was one sixteen. And you're, you know, you're well beaten and at the finish. You get a couple of goals. Those put it puts a better look on the scoreboard, but it puts a different complexion in your head as well. At the end of the day, you, you can you, you have to pay, you have to paint it kind of your own way. It's like you no, know, we were we didn't hurl for the second half and we were beaten by a point in the wind up. That's mm-hmm. how you paint it. Whereas if it's you know we didn't we showed little we, we showed little resistance in the last quarter. And we were beaten by seven or eight, and all of a sudden you're limping into training on Tuesday night, and you're there's less. I put it this way: there's probably less um, psychological damage done by the way they finished, and there's a little bit of heart kind of going forward. 
I got an email there from Marty Burke just two minutes ago. Can you give a shout out to the Derry under 20 hurlers who beat Antrim in the under 20 under 20 hurling final in Corrigan Park, Belfast last Saturday? Won a tight game by three points in testing weather conditions. We now head to Leinster to play uh, Meath and Westmead. Great opportunity to lad. So yeah, congratulations to them. First Dublin time in again. a while. First time in mm. a while, like the Derry defeating Antrim at, at any grade, I would say. So that's a fair result for the boys. Yeah, both Dublin and Westmead will need a, a victory this weekend. Both teams are on two points after playing four games. Westmead beat Antrim. Dublin had um, got their two points from Antrim also. Stole a bit of a result there. There was a mistake which led to a goal. And also there was a mistake which helped out Westmead in their game. Um, I'd be looking at it through the prism of two lads that I had with the Freshers in UCD this year. Could be starting at either end, David Williams and David O'Dooling at either end. So that, that will have me very interested. I'm going to go to this game on Saturday. But you would feel that Michal who thinks like nothing short of a win will do here. Oh, and he's right if that's if that's what he thinks. Like especially um, you know, after after the 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 Limerick result, obviously um, they, and like they had themselves in a good position last weekend against Galway. And was it was it one score in the last twenty five minutes or some something along on along those lines? It was like one fourteen mm. a piece, and they finished on one fifteen. And I think the last score they got was a Donald Burke free in garbage time basically had themselves in a good spot and you know Galway obviously had men on the sideline as well um so there's kind of again there's not too much optimism around kind of Dublin at the minute and I'm no clear as to where they are at this stage in Donahue's second year and that's not having a pop I just don't really know I'm not 100% sure where they are at the minute at, uh, you'd have to say Wexford are ahead of them in the Leinster pecking order too. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't. They, they should. They should get a result against Westmead. The thing about obviously Joe Fortune, in fairness, will have. There couldn't be anyone better on the sideline to try and plot Dublin's downfall. You'd imagine, given the, the the intimate knowledge he has of Dublin hurling and covering all the club games, and he know exactly. Um, he'll know exactly what he's coming up against. And in fairness to Westmead, you take out that. Galway game the first day and they've had a fair campaign you know very competitive against Limerick uh, ran them close they know it finished six in the wind up they were they obviously got that result against Antrim trying to think they were competitive against Tipperary as well um, mm. and that's a good sign that's a good sign from Westmead's point of view I know Offaly were hammered last weekend but it's promising from an Offaly point of view and from a Hurling point of view that these teams have been a good bit more competitive in Division 1 than they had been I think that was Westmead's I think it was Conor McKenna had it that that was Westmead's first top flight win since 1986 um, last weekend. Um, and I know they haven't been in Division 1 that much, but you'd, ho you'd hope that they get a bit of a bounce from that as well. And it was fairly, you know, it was convincing enough in the wind up on the scoreboard anyway. Yeah, I watched Dublin against Westmead in the Walsh Cup, and that was the start of January. So a couple of months, and, you know, I'm sure there's def different players available and not available between now and then. But Dublin won by 22 points. Westmead couldn't get a puck in the second half. That was uh, like they couldn't get the ball up the pitch. That was that was also in Parnell Park. I fancy Dublin to win this one. I think they they should have a bit of a bit between their teeth. Donald Burke is back. Chris Crummy is back. I wonder how close Owen O'Donnell, Paddy Doyle, some of these players are also. So I just about give them the nod in this. And then I suppose the other game that we have to talk about was probably the biggest one of the weekend, which is Limerick against Galway. Is it a simple case of? It's hard to make a case for Galway when you see that Conor Whelan's not there, when you see that Dahi Burke, you know, they're both going to be suspended for this game. And they're two lads who are physically able to compete or certainly should be able to. So who's going to do that job now? Yeah, um, definitely be worried there. I think it's interesting with Dahi Burke playing half back as well. I know he's not available for the weekend. Like you still don't know exactly. You still don't know the makeup of their back line. You don't know who's going to be playing three. Well, that, that's, that's obviously with a basis to say, okay, his athleticism will drive us forward further up the pitch. But like he has a lot. Of, he's still brilliant. He's got a lot of miles on the clock though, and he's so good at minding the square. Surely the easiest thing is to continue to let him mind the square. I would have thought so too. Been honest with you. Um, yeah, he's, he's you just know exactly what you're going to get from him at the edge of the square, generally. Do you know what I mean? And I know they're trying to fit in different lads. They've probably got they've probably got four lads that are all central players, but they can only play two of them there. And they have like you probably say, well, Fintan Murk can play wing back as well, but it looks like they're trying to put him in full back at the minute. Um, you've Grow McInerney, you've Dotty Burke, probably Park Mannion to a lesser extent, maybe 
at, at six and they're trying to fill them in. I'm just not sure. I, I'd have Dottie Burke at three all day, every day at the minute, to be honest with you. Um, and they're obviously going to be missing him at the weekend. It's a, not that it's backs to the wall or anything, but was it, oh, was it one of the COVID years where Galway weren't playing particularly well? Limerick came down to Salt Hill. I think it was Cotton O'Neill's debut. It could have been 2001. It was the day, or 2021. It could be the day Kylie uh, bemoaned some of the play acting, what he reckoned from a Galway point of view, then retracted it a couple of days later. So Galway needs something similar. They need a bit of a, I would say, they need a bit of a performance at the weekend. I'm trying to think, was that actually down at um, the gate grounds? No, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Maybe no, fa- fairly sure it was oh, 2021. Shane O'Neill's second year, I think, because it was feisty enough on the sideline, I think, between O'Neill and Kylie the same day. And they're both oh. Limerick and obviously Imran Limerick panels together. Okay, we'll just quickly run through some of the other fixtures this weekend. 2A, Downer against Mead, Kildare against Carlo, Leisher against Kerry. I'll just keep going through the fixtures and you really can Really quickly, Shane, there was a black card. Um, there was a black card. I don't know if you discussed it. Oh, for Down. The... Oh, my word. Like a black card for for what I saw, and I think the clip is kind of flying around. Like if that's if that's a black card when a, a defender looks to make a genuine attempt and doesn't like there was no drag back, there was no haul down or anything like that from what I could see anyway. Um, that I thought that was a bizarre decision that had a massive effect on that game last weekend. Yeah, um, we have it there. It was twenty twenty two. Um, that was in Limerick the night Hegarty got. Red card. No, no, that was the that was the year after actually. That was the year after Galway beat them. The Thomas's lads came back a couple of weeks after Bally Hale beat them in the club final. That was twenty two. The one I'm ref- referencing was the year before. Okay, but Galway Boston. also won in twenty twenty two. Twenty seven points to one eighteen. Yeah, no, that was that was pretty convincing. I think Fintan yeah. Burke threw over a sideline ball the same the same night. Um, what he actually threw over a sideline ball, one off his left, one off his right that night. But Galway have been good against Limerick in the league, and that's why I would be even despite the personnel that they're missing, I would be expecting a bit of performance at the weekend. Yeah, okay. Um, 2B then, Derrier against Roscommon, Donegal against London, Tyrone against Wicklow. Uh, 3A, Armagh against Loud. And then I was looking at um, Cavan Monaghan. So Cavan, they've two wins already in 3A and their manager, Oli Bellew, was saying it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. We are the talk of the place. People are coming out to see us now. We have a good following. It could be better and we need more. These guys, how they're playing, how they're so comfortable in their own skins, they're going to places where they are expected to suffer defeats and they're getting victories and great performances. And obviously, I know a couple of the lads on the panel from, from Kula days. Sligo are also against Mayo. Then in 3B, for Mana against Longford and Morrickshire against Lancashire. Just a quick one there. Column Lines blind spot. And it's funny, his name, obviously. He's not who he, who he is. But yeah, he just says, refs are a big concern going into the championship already. Really struggling with contact zone and buy-in freeze. Yeah, I would, be, I would have been very... Um, disturbed I'd say would be the word by some of the refereeing last weekend um, and I think it's only natural that when the pool gets smaller and referees are harder to come by and the quality drops a bit like we're going to be talking I guarantee you Shano in, a, in six weeks time we will be chatting most weekends about a big refereeing decision that had a huge bearing on Munster games on Leinster games, I think that's just the, the way the way it is, and the way it's going to be, and it's going to be a common team going forward for a while. I would say. Yeah, John Collins says, "Folks, save the date, Saturday, April thirteenth, live at the Dome, a week before championship. It's going to be a, a club fundraiser run with our game, so we're looking forward to doing that. Uh, great night's entertainment with the our game boys and a host of hurling stars. So we'll be uh, confirming who they are soon, but it's looking like a very very tasty lineup." A stellar show, yeah, and in the dome of all places. I'm going into enemy territory. Surely, maybe, like, we'll have to get maybe Richard Hogan to get a balloon thing for you to walk under as you're, as you're walking in. <laughs> maybe start blowing kisses or blowing bubbles or something like that to the crowd. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, we, we're joined now by Keen Johnson to talk a bit about the football. Keen, the football's back this weekend after a week off. How much are you looking forward to it and what games are really standing out to you? Yeah, no, I can't wait now. Uh, it's coming towards the business end of the season, so for the league anyway. So it's always the most important and, you know, exciting time of it. So, uh, like, the Tyrone Monning game is probably the one that stands out the most because I think whoever wins this game is probably staying up because um, Ross Common are on three points, but they're playing Kerry this week and they have Derry in the, fo- in the last game. So I can't see Ross Common getting any points there. So, like, if Monaghan were to win... 
they'd be on four and they'd even have Tyrone on the head to head and like Tyrone are playing Dublin in their last game. So I think a win for Monaghan or Tyrone here uh, puts them safe. And like even the last day, like I know Monaghan have been poor since beating Dublin in the first round, but like they got Conor McCarthy back, uh, Conor McManus came on and Carl O'Connell as well. So like they're really kind of priming for their, their annual great escape. And um, like Tyrone are uh, a bit injury ridden as well from the last day. I think Michael McKiernan is out, Conkel Patrick is out and maybe Peter Hart as well. And you put that on top of the players who haven't featured yet. You know, it, it could be um, a, a tough day for them, but it, I know they're at home, but it's it's probably a 50-50 game. So, yeah, like, I think that's probably the most important game in Division 1 uh, this weekend. Yeah, we'll, we'll get more into the games just in a little while. But just in terms of, we, we were kind of talking before the show that, you know, who would be the most key players for each of the Division 1 teams? Who are the players that they could do it out? So, Mayo, Derry, Tyrone, Monaghan, Galway, Dublin, Ross, Common, Kerry. We're just going to do Division 1 only this time. But if you could just give us an idea, who do you think are the players that each of these teams just cannot do it out and why? I mean, it'd be very obvious to just say, oh, David Clifford, he's class. Yeah. But, you know, maybe they have other lads who can kick the ball over the bar, not to his... But is there somebody who's, you know, the rest of the team absolutely relies on them for a different reason, for example? Yeah, like I, I kind of I tried to go with players who, if they weren't there, like the the team's game plan would have to change, or the opposition would have to w- would change the way they approach them. To, yeah, if, if they were playing, so that's kind of the, the kind of criteria I went for. Um, now look, I, I said we get carry out in the way, so I went for David Clifford, but uh, I was kind of going to keep that one brief because I, I'll take arguments on the other seven, but <laughs> like a five time All Star, two time Footballer of the Year, and potential goal shouts at 25 like I mean I don't think like there's no way to measure his importance like where it's it's scoring or his presence or even the attention he takes off off everyone else so I think yeah I think that's a that one's a slam dunk Mm, I I used a bad example to say oh well it doesn't have to be David Clifford but I'll probably in this case it does yeah okay Dublin then Dublin yeah so Dublin went for Cluxon um now, the reason why is, so Dublin have lost two championship games in the last 10 years, and he wasn't playing either of them. So, like, I mean, you know, you look at the two games they lost, like even that Mayo won an extra time where they came under real pressure with their kickouts, and I think Evan Comerford was pulled for overcarrying at one stage, and Mayo got a, a point from a free. So, like, you just wonder if he was playing them games, would they have got an extra couple of kickouts away and, and potentially won them? And like even last year in the All Ireland final, like they're a hundred percent on his kickouts in All Ireland final, like in a game that was won by a couple of points in injury time. Um, like so, I think like if he wasn't there, I think teams would be a lot more aggressive to, to Dublin's kickout. And like a lot, a lot of the time, teams don't even bother pressing because they're only wasting energy and they're not going to win it anyways. So, yeah, I I think Cluxton is probably their most important player. Now, look, Brian Fenton is the obviously obvious one that could go up against him, but even like. Uh, Outside of that, like you know, like Con didn't have his best year last year and still won the All Ireland, and like Kilkenny had been in that with the team. Like I think any of the outfield players, like their squad is so deep, they could patch it up some way and still get by. But I think Cluxon is irreplaceable, even though he's he's around so long now. Is is there any other goalkeeper who forces the team to back off and not press up? Yeah, we, well, that, that's actually a good segue into Tyrone because I, I picked Niall Morgan for Tyrone, so. Um, I Can think you imagine what, if, if 15 years ago people were talking about the goalkeeper being the most important player in a team, it'd be laughed away. Yeah, because they were yeah. just there to stand between the goal and you know, stand under the black spot, kick the ball out as far as they could. It's changed yeah, so much. It's gone so far, hasn't it? Like, and you know, even from like Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher saying no one wants to grow up and be a, a Gary Neville or whatever. Like, I mean, like if you're if you're a young lad coming in to get a football now, like it's so so attractive to be a goalkeeper because you're so involved in the game, like. But um, like, I think what Niall Morgan is doing at the minute is unbelievable. Like he's he's nearly like an on-field manager for Tyrone. Like he's he's running games from the goals, and like his kickouts are unbelievable, short and long. And like you look even at that that like the press that Dublin are doing at the minute, like the kind of three banks of four where they leave players uh, free in the far side. Like they're able to do that because they know the opposition keeper doesn't have it in his locker to go over that. So I'd like to see them try that against Tyrone because Morgan has probably the biggest boot in the game and like even go back to the All-Ireland final against Mayo at that time like the two goals that Tyrone got were when Mayo had pressed up on the kick out and Morgan went out over everyone 
and Kilpatrick caught it and then there was space. I think Brian Kennedy flicked the other one on. So like his like if he if he wasn't there, I think teams approach Tyrone changes a lot. And like he he's like he's scoring points from play, he's scoring long range frees, he's assisting like I mean, he's saving points there up over the crossbar last week. Like this, he's he's doing nearly everything, and even from general play, like you know, normally when a team goes back to the goalkeeper, it's you latch on to your man and you let him have it, and let's you know let him come out and see what he's going to do. But when they like when Tyrone go back to Morgan, it's almost like they press him and they leave a, a defender free. Like so, that's nearly the biggest compliment you can pay him. That like other teams are aware that he's more dangerous on the ball than an outfield player. But. Do you, do you reckon, given the skill set that you've talked about there with Morgan, that he's now a better keeper than Stephen Cluxton because he offers more? Is, is there anything that Cluxton currently does better than Morgan? I don't know. Yeah, that, that's that's a hard question. Um, like, obviously, Cluxton wouldn't be able to come off his line and kind of break lines at the pace that Morgan would. Um, yeah, like... Uh, I, I think Morgan would be able to do what Cluxton does for them. Now, that's a big shout, but... You can only if, pick one now. Who are you picking? <laughs> if there's a game in the morning, uh, right now you'd probably have to pick Morgan. But, yeah, no, I just, yeah don't, don't clip that one up. <laughs> See, it's just the coolness <laughs> under pressure that I think, even though he mightn't have the physical stuff, you know, the running in open field that, that Morgan has... There's just the intangibles, the staying cool under pressure, the never fluster in his own defence or whatever. Not that Morgan does, but just think there's just absolute safety. There's guarantees with uh, clucks and that no other keeper gives you. Yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. Like, and even last year, like I was up on the hill for the Mayo game in the quarter final, and like Mayo's, Mayo's press is fairly decent. Like, and like Kieran Donnelly has often said that Mayo's forwards are the best tackling forwards in the country, and. Like you'd be looking like from a vantage point, and you'd be thinking there's nowhere to go, and he's at eye level, and he just picks picks a pass out. You think that wasn't even on, and he still went for it. So, yeah, no, he's he's unbelievable. Changed the game really. Okay, so uh, who do you want to move on to next? Uh, yeah, so we we'll go with Galway. So, like, I I wanted to go for Sean Kelly, but I didn't because I think Galway's backs are fairly well set. So. Like Johnny McGrath has been unbelievable this year. The man marking jobs he's done. Um, like Liam Sillick is back. Uh, John Daly is a very good six. Um, Kieran Malloy. So I think they're fairly. They could maybe cope with the loss of him. Not that he wouldn't be a loss, but a bit more. So I went for Shane Walsh, and I know he's a big name in that. But I just think that his form kind of coincides with Galway's form. Like last year, he was really poor, and Galway had a bad year. And the year before, he couldn't do anything wrong, and Galway almost won the All Ireland. So. I think just like they don't have anyone like him. There's not really any players in the country that have his pace with right and left and his free taking. And you know, it's just when your talisman is is on form, it almost lifts everyone else. So I think he's uh, he's probably the one player ball that can't really do it out. Mm. Jeez, I, yeah, I put Sean Kelly right there beside him, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. My vote. Um, are you going to go with Connor Glass when we talk about Derry? Just, just, I didn't send these on to you in an email or anything. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I I went for Glass, yeah, because, no, it, it was obviously between him and McGuigan, but I think he's just such an all-rounder. Um, like, he does a bit of everything. And, like, he's so strong in the air off both sides of kickouts. And I think, you know, he does so much unseen work. And, like, even the soccer pundits were saying there in the last few weeks about Van Dyke that, like, the great players don't just play their own game. They kind of help other players through the game. And I think Glass does that like from a defensive point of view. Like um like even last year in the league final when he pulled up with the hamstring injury, like they were going all right. Next thing just conceded five goals and he came off. So I think he's kind of the a player who, you know, maybe you don't realise how good he is until he's not there. And uh, you know, you see McLean how he's actually really good going forward as well. He's good for a few uh, points from play. So I think yeah, maybe Shane Wig and Glass is probably a toss up. And I suppose Glass not playing against Dublin. No surprise yeah, exactly. that the Dublin went on to win the game. Um, next team to talk about, Mayo. Mayo, yeah. I, I struggled with Mayo, to be honest. And I've seen James who said there last last couple of weeks that if you'd pick the top 10 players in the country, that Mayo wouldn't have anyone in it. And it's only when you think about it like that that it's kind of true. And, you know, Mayo's strength Paddy is Durkin? probably... Was Paddy Durkin not in the top 10 in the country? Mm, yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah. But it's Mayo is kind of their only their strength is kind of they're an all round solid team rather than 
star individuals, but um, it was between Ryan O'Donoghue and Paddy Durkin for me as well. But uh, I went for Ryan O'Donoghue just because, like, he's the one he's the one bit of stardust that Mayo have. Like, I think a lot of their forwards really aren't uh, scoring from play. Um, I think if anything is is going to happen good for Mayo, it's going to come through him. You know, he he's really good for a couple of points from play, and he's so creative. Um, and he's a solid free taker as well. So yeah, it's him or Paddy Durkin maybe, but yeah, it's it's um it, it's hard to pick for me. I think mm, it's it's a while now since Tommy Conroy came back from his crucial injury. Do you think he's ever fully regained his form since that happened? No, I don't think so. No, and I I don't know what it is like. It's um like because he has great pace and he doesn't seem to have lost that. But I don't know if it's a bit of confidence front of goal. He seems to be um a bit shy in pulling the trigger. Because um, I think everyone remembers that game against Dublin in extra time when he really kind of announced himself. But yeah, like Mayo could really do with him, him firing with Ryan Unhu because like Killing O'Connor and Ed Moshe at this stage, you know, have have probably uh, played their best football. And th- th- it's kind of one or the other at the minute with them. Like they're, the two of them are never on the pitch at the same time. It's always kind of substitution for each other. So yeah, no, they really need Tommy Conroy back, back to his best. Uh, Monaghan. Monaghan, yeah, like, I wanted to pick Rory Beckham. There was too many goalkeepers in this, but uh, I don't think he's going to be back by the news there at the weekend. So, um, he yeah, signed so with, with an agency or something. An like agency, that. Yeah, so they, I mean that that's must be a good sign. So, it's, and the fact they're staying out there for next year, what couple of weeks. So, yeah, so um, I went for Conor McCarthy. Just like he's a player who was really silky forward and. He was always burning it up in the Sigerson with UCD, and you were kind of wondering why you weren't seeing it off as often for Monaghan. And I don't know, as he kind of just struggled with just the modern game and the inside forwards finding it so tough. But like putting him wing back was kind of a stroke of genius last year because he got his well deserved All Star, and he was the best player by by a long way. And you know he's able to attack from deep, and he has the pace, and he's well able to score from being in the forwards. So um, yeah, if if Began doesn't come back, I think Conor McCarthy is is probably Monaghan's most important player. Okay, um, Ross Common. Ross Common, yeah. So I went for Ben O'Carroll, and the reason why I went for him is he's 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 playing a very specific role that I don't think there's many players in the country can do what he's doing. So definitely with him, Ross Common, he's the only one that can do it. Like he's playing up front on his own, and his his primary job is just to go out in front and secure possession, and he's so good at it. Um, he's unbelievable at making the ball stick, and it's such a release for Ross Common that they can just look up and put the ball in and they know it's going to stick because if, if you have a forward in there who you're not sure whether it's going to stick to him you're not going to kick it but like I think uh, like if he wasn't there I think Ross Common would have to change the way they play so that's that was kind of my great criteria and I put him in there but I think just just in my opinion now I think uh, like he's getting he's getting 20 plus possessions a game and I think if you're an inside forward and you're getting that many possessions close to goal I think he needs to start hurting the scoreboard a bit more Um and I, like I, like David Burke is obviously happy with him what he's doing because he, he's playing every game, but he's not really scoring heavily at all. And I, I think he's capable of it because I remember watching him under twenty level and even in the club champion for Bridges this year he was the top scorer in the club. So um, I, I think it's more the role he's been asked to play. And like I don't know if he loves scoring enough. I, I think as a forward you need to really you have to love scoring because I think when he gets the ball. His first thought is who can I give it to, whereas you know maybe a Clifford or Common they get the ball. Their first thought is how can I get a shot off. So um, yeah, so Ben O'Carroll I think for us Common. Okay, and then just to to move on to some of the fixtures this weekend. By the way, get your comments in. We we have covered every county there, haven't we? I think we have. Uh, yeah, that was the all, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, Mayo are playing Derry this weekend, and Connor Glass was talking this week at the John West launch, and he's saying about Mickey Hart. You know, obviously, you know, coming over from going through and going across enemy lines, he said it's been utterly enjoyable, to be honest. Coming into a new environment, whether it be management, coaches, training, meetings, it's all been different. So it gives you a different feel to it because you probably become sick of the same old regime. It brought that sense of difference uh, in energy to it, which is good. As I said before, we were eight points from four games, eight points from five games now. So it's a pretty good start for a team that only got promoted to Division One. We're doing a lot of good things right. Uh, Mickey brings a sense of old school towards it as well in terms of how he speaks to the players. Gavin Devlin is more so the coach. He does a lot of the coaching and training, most of the pre-season, pre-training meetings and that sort of way. So they bounce it off well together and they supplement each other pretty well. I think the main thing is that we don't want to be playing as robots. You want to go out and play on instinct like uh, certain boys have better attributes than others. 
it might be my defensive attributes, but Cormac Murphy might bring an attacking presence. So it's about playing with that kind of freedom as well and backing yourself. So whatever you're good at, basically go out and play that way. So Mayo Derry this weekend, it's in McHale Park. And just looking at the GA League Tables Twitter account, which is absolutely brilliant, um, Derry have this game obviously away to Mayo and then at home to Roscommon. Now, the way Roscommon are going, I'm sure that Derry would feel like, OK, we could actually win that game and, and sort of put out a bit of a, a mock side this weekend. Or do you feel like because Derry had lost to Dublin, they want to gain back a bit of momentum this weekend and get a victory here? Yeah, I, th- I think we'll see a full strength Derry this weekend, um, you know, after the rest and a lot of players against Dublin and then they had the week off. So like that was two weeks off for a lot of their players. So I, I think they'll want to get it done this week. They'll probably be in the league final anyway. So without like Ross Common will be open they they win this week so they might rest a few against them but I think they will they, I think I think Derry will win as well because I I don't know if you've seen uh, Kevin McStay's interview there after the Ross Common game but he was kind of getting interviewed by local media and they were saying like we're back in the race for the league title and Kevin McStay was like are we and then yeah uh, he was like the journalist was like well of course we are he was like we're, we've Dublin on the head to head and if we beat Derry. In the next game, we'll have them on the head to head, so we have a good chance of a league final. And Kevin McStay was like down with that sort of talk. So I think Mayo have no interest in a league final, and like they're, they're playing Ross. No, they're playing New York in the first round of the championship, uh, the first week of April. So I, I think Mayo will be doing their best to get themselves out of this league title. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to have a competition! Teams don't want to get the finals. Same in Ireland as well. It's it's utterly ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, Surely it should just be whoever finishes the league top gets the title and leave it at that. Yeah, you would think so, yeah. And just on that, actually, did you, have you, did you see the TV schedule for the weekend with the Hurling football? The kind of yeah, there's one Hurling game in four football, even though it's the last round of the Hurling. Yeah, that makes no sense at all. I was just wondering what the, what the crack was with that. I, I would imagine it's partly down to the counties themselves and schedule and stuff like that. And maybe to some degree, the broadcasters are looking at the games thinking we'll get good um, get good views in these things. But I'd say some of it too is down to the counties themselves and who wants to be broadcast. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I suppose, look, so that's that game. We're expecting Tur- Derry to probably go there and win that game. Throwing against Monaghan, like Monaghan have the second longest unbroken run in Division 1 just behind Kerry. But they need to beat Tyrone here. I'll just bring the table back up again. They need to beat Tyrone. And if Monaghan beat Tyrone, they'll be ahead of them on the head-to-head, which you'd suspect that if Tyrone win this game in Oma, that that's Monaghan gone because otherwise Monaghan would be hoping for Roscommon to lose and then for them to get a win the last day and somehow scrape through. Yeah, yeah. And if if Monaghan were to win, they'd have Tyrone head-to-head. And Tyrone are playing Dublin and Co Park in the last game, so you can't really see them getting anything there. Dublin would love to relegate Tyrone too, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, but um, no, like I, I don't know. Like every year, they just find a way to stay up. But you, you, like I mean, we spoke about it a few weeks ago about going out to Division Two not being the end of the world. So uh, I don't know. Even it, it might be the best thing for Vinnie Corey just to to blood a few young players. I know nobody wants to get relegated, and it's, it's disappointment at the time. But um, you know, it might be the worst thing. But why have things gone so pear-shaped from Mon- for Monaghan ever since that first day out against Dublin? Was that just we didn't see the proper Dublin? Or, you know, like, how can they have been that thrilling and now be, you know, like, even if we look at their, their scoring difference here, it's not exactly brilliant, minus 40. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, m- maybe Dublin kind of were sleepwalking into it, but at the same time yeah it's it, it's hard to to understand why they were so good that night and then they've been really off the pace since and like i i, I even the last day against Galway, i didn't feel they were too um you know they weren't really out of the game it's the three goals like you'll never see you wouldn't see three softer goals in any game and uh, as we just spoke about rory beckham it's just you know you, you realize how good he is when he's gone like three balls kind of dropping into the square and, and you end up in the net like division one level you know you're going to be punished so yeah, no, Tyrone Monaghan is definitely the, the game of the weekend in Division 1. Galway Dublin, like, to be fair, Galway Dublin could be quite good. You'd imagine there'd be a lot of Galway people around because you've got Limerick coming to town and also the Dubs. So we could have a nice little atmosphere down there. Yeah, yeah, that's a good double header, yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know about Galway with their missing so many players going up against probably Dublin's full strength looking at a league final. I, I think Galway have actually done really well to get the five points with considering the players they're missing. Um, and I think that like that five points will probably do them safe. 
and then just roll on to the championship. And you know, Parik Joyce is in year five now, so it, it really is all about you know, you know the championship, not even Connacht. Like it's it's really about the knockout stuff for him because uh, after getting to the All Ireland final two years ago, it was a real disappointment last year. So. Yeah, I, I think I'll be happy enough with their league uh, f- f- for so far, and that'll probably do them. Yeah, geez, that's that's some finish for Galway away to do- or sorry, home to Dublin and then away to Kerry. Really not easy at all. Um, yeah. yeah. So and then I suppose the the other fixture in in that division, Ross Common against Kerry. What do you what are you expecting from Ross Common at this stage? There is a sense that just. Things have unraveled a little bit. Now, I know they've time to put it right and all that kind of stuff, and they could end up having a great connect, but there is a sense that it's just kind of struggling at the moment. Yeah, no, Jesus, Ross Common were off the last day against Mayo. Like, I think the score was seven points or something, and then, you know, a, a couple of points from play. Like, I mean, at the forwards that Ross Common have, like, how can you be only scoring three or four points from play in a game? Um, and, and it was only a couple of weeks before that David Work was saying the boys would be on the training field in the morning. So, you so, know, I wonder what time they were training after that game, but um, yeah, no, I, I, I think Kerry will have a couple of points to spare at least in that game. And like, I know it, it's Ross Common's last home game, and they're going to Derry the week after. But yeah, no, I, I would agree. I think it is. It, it just cracks starting to show. Like last year, they had it was David Burke's first year, and they were flying fit, and they were kind of bouncing off the ground in the league games. But this year, it's kind of second season syndrome, and they're, they're really struggling for results. But um, yeah, and no, like Ross Common, our team who've typically bounced between one and two anyway. So look, I don't, I don't think relegation is going to cost David Work his job. Like, but um, you know, it'll, it'll be about the championship for them. Do you, do you expect Connor Cox to be thrown in here? Because you know, if you're looking for some sort of a spark against his native county, you'll probably want to put his best foot forward. So use any ledge you might be able to get. Yeah, I, I don't know why Connor Cox is to use more. Like, I mean, when he when he first came, he was unbelievable. Like, he he won them that Connacht final, and he was always. He was always good for a few points from play, and he was able to kick off both feet. He was a real handful, like so. I don't know if it's again if it's just forwards being lost to the modern game or uh, work rate right off the ball or what it is. But like, um, do you know, with is it Kieran Murta is, is gone now? Like you still have Dermot Murta, the two Smiths, Ben O'Carroll. Like they do have a nice forward line there, but Connor Cox only seems to get kind of ten minutes off the bench here and there. So like, I I don't know why why he's not getting more game time. Yeah. Mm, just in terms of Division 2 then, Armagh against Cavan, Kildare against Donegal. And actually, with the kildare Donegal one, you know, we've seen the fallout, especially after the Armagh game, with uh, the mood in Kildare, you know, Glen Ryan is obviously in battle somewhat, but the Kildare, kildare uh, chairman, Tommy Gorman, he was saying, since the last beating, the comment from the national media has been very disappointing. This is in the Leinster leader. We as management committee fully support every management team and players as they continue to represent their county. But that sort of flies in the face of how, you know, Glenn Ryan seemed to be questioned a few weeks back. And you just wonder, do you feel like, you know, we're talking about Ross Common, can they arrest their slight? Can Kildare? Uh, not this week anyway. I don't think they're going to beat Tony Gall. Um, like Tony Gall win and they're promoted. So I, I think, you know, this is a, a fairly um, straightforward game for, for, for the weekend. But, yeah, I don't know. Like, I thought Kildare were all right at times against Cork. Like, they made Cork look fairly average. Um, and Daniel Flynn back as well is a plus, but like I mean, it was it five losses in a row, it's more than likely going to be six. Um, like that's not easy in, in any setup. And you know, I know they're on the opposite side of Dublin in the championship, so I mean, it's 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 all about that now for for Glen Ryan that management team because they have to get to that Leinster final, otherwise, you know, it's it's a disaster of a season. Do you think they're better off being in the Salchon Cup this year, given the way this has gone, get knocked out early? Not in a disgraceful way, because then you could even see a managerial change. But like from Glenn Ryan's point of view, OK, we do OK in Leinster. Don't quite get to the final. I'm sure he wants to get to the final. But like, are they better off almost just going the long route, winning a Talton Cup and guaranteeing Sam Maguire entry for next year? Yeah, they probably are. But I, I, I don't know. Is that a very hard sell to players who have been in Division 1 and have knocked Mayo out of the championship? Like. It is, I, I, but like, look at the flip side, right? Let's say they go to a Leinster final, get beaten by 15 points, right? That could happen. It, it may not, but it could happen. And then let's say they go into the back door and they end up in a group and take a couple of hockey ins as well. Jeez, what's the mood going to be like then? Yeah, and, and like realistically, that probably would happen. But uh, I, I think players have too much ego. Sometimes, like, I, 
I don't know what some of them experienced because their players want to play in the Hanson Cup. I think a lot of them would potentially go to America or something like that. Well, wouldn't that kind of typify the whole problem anyway? With, yeah, with maybe their so. The players, is it the players' attitude is part of the reason that they are where they are? Maybe so, yeah. Like, uh, like even with me last year, like, I mean, Colin O'Rourke was his first year and it was a lot, like, Mead's me, squad is a lot younger. There's not many experienced players, so maybe that was easier to get them on board. But, yeah, I don't know, like, Glenn Ryan and this management team, like, they're probably the four best Kildare players really ever. Like, so, like, they would have went in there the first day of team meeting saying, we're going to topple Dublin, like, you know, it's like, we're not going to be playing the Thousand Cup. So, I, I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see how, how it unfolds. Yeah, okay. Um, just the other games, uh, Loud against Fermanagh, Mead against Cork. I mean, Loud started the season really, really well. And they've just had it like, and they had, let's say, a, t- a tight defeat against the likes of Armagh and just the fixtures, the, the results. I mean, minus seven after five games and four defeats shows that they've been really, really close. But, you know, that's that's a difficult one for Jerry Brennan. He'd like another result or two on the board at this stage. Yeah, and they've really carried it on from Mickey Hart, like the standard and the, the strength and condition. And they're really, you know, a, a top, uh, top uh, tier division uh, team now. But, yeah, like I've seen Jared Brendan was saying during the week that this is essentially a championship game. So, you know, it, it's mad how team's season can kind of hinge on this. Like if they were to win and stay up and then bring that into the championship, if they lose, they end up in Division 3 and possibly in the Tatsun Cup again. So, yeah, no, that's a really tight one. And then even the, the Cavan Armagh game, I think, is probably the outside of uh, Tyrone Monaghan, the second most interesting game because... Like, if Cavan can beat Armagh, they'd have them on the head-to-head and then they have Fermanagh at home. So I think that would be a bit of a disaster for Armagh if they were to end up not getting promoted at this stage. And yeah, I, I don't really know what to make of Armagh, like, just in general. Like, I mean, you know, they've been really close the last few years with penalty shootouts and that. And, like, even in my club, we've lost two penalty shootouts in, in uh, semi-finals recently. Did you miss yours? Sorry? Did you score yours or miss uh, yours? I, I didn't step up. Didn't step up. Not a penalty tech. Okay. Uh, penalty don't like players balls but uh like sometimes when you lose like that it's you, you fall you fall into the trap of feeling sorry for yourself because like you know technically we didn't lose and penalty shouldn't be in the ga but like at some stage you kind of have to just look at yourself and say we had 90 minutes to win games and it just hasn't been good enough and like like some people in Armagh would say that like the club football isn't hectic at the minute and he's getting the best out of what he has but then Others would say that he's been there so long and the record in Ulster has been poor and that it's time for someone else to have a go. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to know what I'm at. They're just they're always one performance away from just let, letting you down. Like So it's, it's kind of slow to get excited by them. Mm. Would you be in any way excited by what you're seeing from Cork lately? They're against Mead this weekend and can't help but think, you know, 35 years ago or whatever, they were playing in some of the most physical games ever seen. I don't think anyone expects that this weekend, but have Cork shown you much lately? Um, they, were, they were really poor in the first half last week against Kildare and picked it up, but they always had nice forwards. That was, that was always a thing with Cork and, and to do with the minute. I really like Conor Corbett as a player. And yeah. He, he was classed uh, when they won the under 20. And like, he has all the tools. Like So I think... So you can build a team around the likes of him and Kotlo Matani has struggled really with injury. Um, but, you know, like, they have done well to kind of rest their season because it was looking like them and Kildare were, were, were in um, real trouble for a while. They're after getting two wins and, yeah, like, they, they really needed that because they have Kerry in, in the Munster. But, yeah, no, like, we need a good Cork. Like, I mean, they, they pushed Derry fairly close last year in the quarterfinal. So, you know, it, w- it would be a shame if they... If they kind of start going downhill from here but yeah no we could do with a good Cork Cork team back yeah okay uh, P174 says that Kildare management team on paper is very good with great players but maybe they need a few lads around them who are lesser players and maybe more understanding of players deficiencies good point uh, Keen, I'm just going to go through the division three and four fixtures and if there's anything that sticks out you can maybe make a point on it so Clare will meet Antrim that's going to be in Ennis Wicklow Limerick Sligo versus Offaly and Markovic Park Westmead down, and then Division 4 will see Wexford travel to Tipperary, Leash will host Leitrim, Carlo are going to Longford, and London are against Watford. So does anything stick out to you there? Yeah, in, in Division 3, so down in Westmead, is whoever wins that is basically promoted, but I think if Westmead win, that'll bring Clare back into it, because Clare are only two points behind, and if Clare were to beat Antrim, which you'd expect, then Clare have down in the last game, so then 
Claire, if Claire beat them, they'd have them in the head to head. So, like, I mean, if Claire were to go straight back up after, you know, all the the absentees from last year, I mean, that would be unbelievable. Um, and they were very unlucky against Westmead. The only game they've lost with that with that square ball that time. So, yeah, th- th- that's the standout from Division Three. And like Division Four is really interesting, like because Leeds are as good as promoted. And then there's Leitrim, Wexford, Longford, Carlow, all in six, and Tip on four. So, like, the only teams that are out of it are the bottom two. So, like, I mean, that could go anyway the next couple of weeks. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, look, I think that's pretty much it. Anything else you want to touch on before we finish up, or are you happy enough with that? No, I was just uh, wondering if Mike have any tips there, but he's after shooting off. He's, he's gone and done a runner on us. Okay, well, look, great <laughs> stuff, Keen. Look, we'll have you back on the show again soon, hopefully, if you're available to do it. Thanks very much. Cheers, man.